Chapter 17 Watchers and Hunters After the wisdom left him, Rand made his way to the common room. He needed to hear people laughing, to forget what Nynaeve had said and the trouble she might cause alike. The room was crowded indeed, but no one was laughing, though every chair and bench was filled and people lined the walls. Tom was performing again, standing on a table against the far wall, his gestures grand enough to fill the big room. It was the great hunt of the horn again, but no one complained, of course. There were so many tales to be told about each of the hunters, and so many hunters to tell of, that no two tellings were ever the same. The whole of it in one telling would have taken a week or more. The only sound competing with the gleeman's voice and harp was the crackling of the fires in the fireplaces. To the eight corners of the world the hunters ride. To the eight pillars of heaven, where the winds of time blow and fate seizes the mighty and the small alike by the forelock. Now, the greatest of the hunters is Rogash of Talmor. Rogash Eagle Eye. Famed at the court of the High King, feared on the slopes of Shalgul. Hunters were always mighty heroes, all of them. Rand spotted his two friends and squeezed onto a place Perrin made for him on the end of their bench. Kitchen smells drifting into the room reminded him that he was hungry, but even the people who had food in front of them gave it little attention. The maids, who should have been serving, stood entranced, clutching their aprons and looking at the gleeman, and nobody seemed to mind at all. Listening was better than eating, no matter how good the food. Since the day of her birth has the Dark One marked Blaze as his own. But not of this mind is she. No dark friend, Blaze of Matuchin. Strong as the ash she stands, lithe as the willow branch, beautiful as the rose. Golden-haired Blaze. Ready to die before she yields. But hark! Echoing from the towers of the city, trumpets blare, brazen and bold. Her heralds proclaim the arrival of a hero at her court. Drums thunder and cymbals sing. Rogash Eagle Eye comes to do homage. The bargain of Rogash Eagle Eye wound its way to an end, but Tom paused only to wet his throat for a mug of ale before launching into Leon's Stand. In turn, that was followed by the fall of Aleth Loriel and Gaidel Cain's sword, and the last ride of Buad of Albane. The pauses grew longer as the evening wore on, and when Tom exchanged the harp for his flute, everyone knew it was the end of storytelling for the night. Two men joined Tom, with a drum and a hammered dulcimer, but sitting beside the table while he remained atop it. The three young men from Emmonsfield began clapping their hands with the first note of The Wind That Shakes the Willow, and they were not the only ones. It was a favorite in the two rivers, and in Berlon too, it seemed. Here and there, voices even took up the words, not so off-key as for anyone to hush them. My love is gone, carried away by the wind that shakes the willow, and all the land is beaten hard by the wind that shakes the willow. But I will hold her close to me in heart and dearest memory, and with her strength to steal my soul, her love to warm my heartstrings, I will stand where we once sang... The cold wind shakes the willow. The second song was not so sad. In fact, only one bucket of water seemed even more merry than usual by comparison, which might have been the gleeman's intent. People rushed to clear tables from the floor to make room for dancing and began kicking up their heels until the walls shook from the stomping and whirling. The first dance ended with laughing dancers leaving the floor holding their sides and new people taking their places. Tom played the opening notes of Wild Geese on the Wing, then paused for people to take their places for the reel. I think I'll try a few steps, Rand said, getting to his feet. Perrin popped up right behind him. Matt was the last to move, and so found himself staying behind to guard the cloaks, along with Rand's sword and Perrin's axe. Remember, I want to turn two, Matt called after them. The dancers formed two long lines facing each other, men in one, women in the other. First the drum and then the dulcimer took up the beat, and all the dancers began bending their knees in time. The girl across from Rand, her dark hair in braids that made him think of home, gave him a shy smile, and then a wink that was not shy at all. Tom's flute leaped into the tune, and Rand moved forward to meet the dark-haired girl. 
She threw back her head and laughed as he spun her around and passed her on to the next man in line. Everyone in the room was laughing, he thought, as he danced around his next partner, one of the serving maids with her apron flapping wildly. The only unsmiling face he saw was on a man huddled by one of the fireplaces, and that fellow had a scar that crossed his whole face from one temple to the opposite jaw, giving his nose a slant and drawing the corner of his mouth down. The man met his gaze and grimaced, and Rand looked away in embarrassment. Maybe with that scar the fellow could not smile. He caught his next partner as she spun and whirled her in a circle before passing her on. Three more women danced with him as the music gained speed. Then he was back with the first dark-haired girl for a fast promenade that changed the lines about completely. She was still laughing, and she gave him another wink. The scar-faced man was scowling at him. His step faltered and his cheeks grew hot. He had not meant to embarrass the fellow. He really did not think he had stared. He turned to meet his next partner and forgot all about the man. The next woman to dance into his arms was Nynaeve. He stumbled through the steps, almost tripping over his own feet, nearly stepping on hers. She danced gracefully enough to make up for his clumsiness, smiling the while. I thought you were a better dancer, she laughed, as they changed partners. He had only a moment to gather himself before they changed again, and he found himself dancing with Moraine. If he had thought he was stumble-footed with the wisdom, it was nothing to how he felt with the eyes to die. She glided across the floor smoothly, her gown swirling about her. He almost fell twice. She gave him a sympathetic smile, which made it worse rather than helping. It was a relief to go to his next partner in the pattern, even if it was Egwene. He regained some of his poise. After all, he had danced with her for years. Her hair still hung unbraided, but she had gathered it back with a red ribbon. Probably couldn't decide whether to please Moraine or Nynaeve, he thought sourly. Her lips were parted, and she looked as if she wanted to say something, but she never spoke, and he was not about to speak first. Not after the way she had cut off his earlier attempt in the private dining room. They stared at one another soberly and danced apart without a word. He was glad enough to return to the bench when the reel was done. The music for another dance, a jig, began while he was sitting down. Matt hurried to join in, and Perrin slid onto the bench as he was leaving. Did you see her? Perrin began before he was even seated. Did you? Which one? Rand asked. The Wisdom or Mistress Alice? I danced with both of them. The I... Mistress Alice, too? Perrin exclaimed. I danced with Nynaeve. I didn't even know she danced. She never does at any of the dances back home. I wonder, Rand said thoughtfully, what the women's circle would say about the wisdom dancing. Maybe that's why. Then the music and the clapping and the singing were too loud for any further talk. Rand and Perrin joined in the clapping as the dancers circled the floor. Several times he became aware of the scar-faced man staring at him. The man had a right to be touchy with that scar, but Rand did not see anything he could do now that would not make matters worse. He concentrated on the music and avoided looking at the fellow. The dancing and singing went on into the night. The maids finally did remember their duties. Rand was glad to wolf down some hot stew and bread. Everyone ate where they sat or stood. Rand joined in three more dances, and he managed his steps better when he found himself dancing with Nynaeve again and with Moraine as well. This time they both complimented him on his dancing, which made him stammer. He danced with Egwene again, too. She stared at him, dark-eyed and always seeming on the point of speaking, but never saying a word. He was just as silent as she, but he was sure he did not scowl at her, no matter what Matt said when he returned to the bench. Toward midnight, Moraine left. Egwene, after one harried look from the Aes Sedai to Naive, hurried after her. The Wisdom watched them with an unreadable expression, then deliberately joined in another dance before she left, too, with a look as if she had gained a point on the Aes Sedai. Soon Tom was putting his flute into its case and arguing good-naturedly with those who wanted him to stay longer. Land came by to gather up Rand and the others. We have to make an early start, the warder said, leaning close to be heard over the noise. And we will need all the rest we can get. There's a fellow been staring at me, Matt said. A man with a scar across his face. You don't think he could be a... One of the friends you warned us about? Like this, Rand said, drawing a finger across his nose to the corner of his mouth. He stared at me, too. He looked around the room. 
People were drifting away, and most of those still left clustered around Tom. He's not here now. I saw the man, Lan said. According to Master Fitch, he's a spy for the White Cloaks. He's no worry to us. Maybe he was not, but Rand could see something was bothering the warder. Rand glanced at Matt, who had the stiff expression on his face that always meant he was hiding something. A White Cloak spy. Could Bornhald want to get back at us that much? We're leaving early, he said. Really early? Maybe they could be gone before anything came of it. At first light, the warder replied. As they left the common room, Matt singing snatches of song under his breath and Perrin stopping now and again to try out a new step he had learned, Tom joined them in high spirits. Lan's face was expressionless as they headed for the stairs. Where is Nynaeve sleeping? Matt asked. Master Fitch said we got the last rooms. She has a bed, Tom said dryly. In with Mistress Alice and the girl. Perrin whistled between his teeth and Matt muttered. Blood and ashes. I wouldn't be in Egwene's shoes for all the gold in Camelin. Not for the first time, Rand wished Matt could think seriously about something for more than two minutes. Their own shoes were not very comfortable right then. I'm going to get some milk, he said. Maybe it would help him sleep. Maybe I won't dream tonight. Lan looked at him sharply. There's something wrong tonight. Don't wander far. And remember, we leave whether you are awake enough to sit in your saddle or have to be tied on. The warder started up the stairs, the others followed him. Their jollity subdued. Rand stood in the hall alone. After having so many people around, it was lonely indeed. He hurried to the kitchen, where a scullery maid was still on duty. She poured a mug of milk from a big stone crock for him. As he came out of the kitchen, drinking, a shape in dull black started toward him down the length of the hall raising pale hands to toss back the dark cowl that had hidden the face beneath. The cloak hung motionless as the figure moved, and the face, a man's face but pasty white, like a slug under a rock, and eyeless. From oily black hair to puffy cheeks was as smooth as an eggshell. Rand choked, spraying milk. You are one of them, boy, the fade said a hoarse whisper like a file softly drawn across bone. Dropping the mug, Rand backed away. He wanted to run, but it was all he could do to make his feet take one halting step at a time. He could not break free of that eyeless face. His gaze was held and his stomach curdled. He tried to shout for help, to scream. His throat was like stone. Every ragged breath hurt. The fade glided closer, in no hurry. Its strides had a sinuous, deadly grace, like a viper, the resemblance emphasized by the overlapping black plates of armor down its chest. Thin, bloodless lips curved in a cruel smile, made more mocking by the smooth, pale skin where eyes should have been. The voice made Bornhalds seem warm and soft. Where are the others? I know they are here. Speak, boy, and I will let you live. Rand's back struck wood, a wall or a door. He could not make himself look around to see which. Now that his feet had stopped, he could not make them start again. He shivered, watching the murdral slither nearer. His shaking grew harder with every slow stride. Speak, I say, or... From above came a quick clatter of boots from the stairs up the hall, and the murdral cut off, whirling. The cloak hung still. For an instant, the fade's head tilted, as if that eyeless gaze could pierce the wooden wall. A sword appeared in a dead white hand, blade as black as the cloak. The light in the hall seemed to grow dimmer in the presence of that blade. The pounding of boots grew louder and the fade spun back to Rand, an almost boneless movement. The black blade rose, narrow lips peeled back in a rictus snarl. Trembling, Rand knew he was going to die. Midnight steel flashed at his head and stopped. You belong to the great lord of the dark. The breathy grating of that voice sounded like fingernails scratched across a slate. You are his. Spinning in a black blur, the fade darted down the hall away from Rand. The shadows at the end of the hall reached out and embraced it, and it was gone. Lan leaped down the last stairs, landing with a crash, sword in hand. Rand struggled to find his voice. Fade, he gasped. It was... 
Abruptly, he remembered his sword. With the murderer facing him, he had never thought of it. He fumbled the heron marked blade out now, not caring if it was too late. It ran that way. Lan nodded absently. He seemed to be listening to something else. Yes. It's going. Fading. No time to pursue it now. We're leaving, sheepherder. More boots stumbled down the stairs. Matt and Perrin and Tom hung about with blankets and saddlebags. Matt was still buckling his bedroll, with his bow awkward under his arm. Leaving, Rand said. Sheathing his sword, he took his things from Tom. Now? In the night? You want to wait for the half-man to come back, sheep herder? The warder said impatiently. For half a dozen of them? It knows where we are now. I'll ride with you again, Tom told the warder, if you have no great objections. Too many people remember that I arrived with you. I fear that before tomorrow this will be a bad place to be known as your friend. You can ride with us or ride to Shale Ghoul, Gleeman. Land's scabbard rattled from the force with which he rammed his sword home. A stableman came darting past them from the rear door, and then Moraine appeared with Master Fitch, and behind them Egwene, with her bundled shawl in her arms. And Nynaeve. Egwene looked frightened almost to tears, but the wisdom's face was a mask of cool anger. You must take this seriously, Moraine was telling the innkeeper. You will certainly have trouble here by morning. Dark friends, perhaps. Perhaps worse. When it comes, quickly make it clear that we are gone. Offer no resistance. Just let whoever it is know that we left in the night, and they should bother you no further. It is us they are after. Never you worry about trouble, Master Fitch replied jovially. Never a bit. If any come around my inn trying to make trouble for my guests, well, they'll get short shrift from the lads and I. Short shrift. And they'll hear not a word about where you've gone or when. Or even if you are ever here. I've no use for that kind. Not a word will be spoken about you by any here. Not a word. But... Mistress Alice, I really must see to your horses if you're going to leave in good order. He pulled loose from her grip on his sleeve and trotted in the direction of the stables. Moraine sighed vexedly. Stubborn, stubborn man. He will not listen. You think Trollocs might come here hunting for us? Matt asked. Trollocs, Moraine snapped. Of course not. There are other things to fear, not the least of which is how we were found. Ignoring Matt's bristle, she went right on. The Fade cannot believe we will remain here, now that we know it has found us. But Master Fitch takes dark friends too lightly. He thinks of them as wretches hiding in the shadows. But dark friends can be found in the shops and streets of every city, and in the highest councils, too. The Murdral may send them to see if he can learn of our plans. She turned on her heel and left, Lan close behind her. As they started for the stable yard, Rand fell in beside Nynaeve. She had her saddlebags and blankets, too. So you're coming after all, he said. Min was right. Was there something down here? She asked quietly. She said it was... She stopped abruptly and looked at him. A fade, he answered. He was amazed that he could say it so calmly. It was in the hall with me, and then Lan came. Nynaeve shrugged her cloak against the wind as they left the inn. Perhaps there is something after you, but I came to see you safely back to Emmons Field, all of you, and I will not leave till that is done. I won't leave you alone with her sort. Lights moved in the stables where the ostlers were saddling the horses. Much? The innkeeper shouted from the stable door where he stood with Moraine. Stir your bones! He turned back to her, appearing to attempt to soothe her rather than really listening when she spoke, though he did it deferentially, with bows interspersed among the orders called to the stableman. The horses were led out, the stableman grumbling softly about the hurry and the lateness. Rand held Egwene's bundle, handing it up to her when she was on Bella's back. She looked back at him with wide, fear-filled eyes. At least she doesn't think it's an adventure anymore. He was ashamed as soon as he thought it. She was in danger because of him and the others. Even riding back to Emmons Field alone would be safer than going on. Egwene, I... The words died in his mouth. She was too stubborn to just turn back. 
Not after saying she was going all the way to Tarvalon. What about what Min saw? She's part of it. Light, part of what? Egwene, he said. I'm sorry. I can't seem to think straight anymore. She leaned down to grip his hand hard. In the light from the stable, he could see her face clearly. She did not look as frightened as she had. Once they were all mounted, Master Fitch insisted on leading them to the gates, the stablemen lighting the way with their lamps. The round-bellied innkeeper bowed them on their way with assurances that he would keep their secrets and invitations to come again. Much watched them leave as sourly as he had watched them arrive. There was one, Rand thought, who would not give short shrift to anyone, or any kind of shrift. Much would tell the first person who asked him when they had gone, and everything else he could think of concerning them. A little distance down the street, he looked back. One figure stood, lamp raised high, peering after them. He did not need to see the face to know it was much. The streets of Berlon were abandoned at that hour of the night. Only a few faint glimmers here and there escaped tightly closed shutters, and the light of the moon in its last quarter waxed and waned with the wind-driven clouds. Now and again, a dog barked as they passed an alleyway, but no other sound disturbed the night, except their horses' hooves and the wind whistling across the rooftops. The riders held an even deeper silence, huddled in their cloaks and their own thoughts. The warder led the way, as usual, with Moraine and Egwene close behind. Nynaeve kept near the girl, and the others brought up the rear in a tight cluster. Land kept the horses moving at a brisk walk. Rand watched the streets around them warily, and he noticed his friends doing the same. Shifting moon shadows were called the shadows at the end of the hall, the way they had seemed to reach out to the fade. An occasional noise in the distance, like a barrel toppling or a dog barking, jerked every head around. Slowly, bit by bit, as they made their way through the town, they all bunched their horses closer to Land's black stallion and Moraine's white mare. At the Camelin Gate, Land dismounted and hammered with his fist on the door of a small square stone building squatting against the wall. A weary watchman appeared, rubbing sleepily at his face. As Land spoke, his sleepiness vanished, and he stared past the warder to the others. "'You want to leave?' he exclaimed. "'Now? In the night? You must be mad!' "'Unless there is some order from the governor that prohibits our leaving,' Moraine said. She had dismounted as well, but she stayed back from the door, out of the light that spilled into the dark street. "'Not exactly, mistress.' The watchman peered at her, frowning as he tried to make out her face. But the gates stay shut from sundown to sunup. No one to come in except in daylight. That's the order. Anyway, there are wolves out there. Killed a dozen cows in the last week. Could kill a man just as easy. No one to come in, but nothing about leaving, Moraine said, as if that settled the matter. You see? We are not asking you to disobey the governor. Land pressed something into the watchman's hand. For your trouble, he murmured. I suppose, the watchman said slowly. He glanced at his hand. Gold glinted before he hastily stuffed it in his pocket. I suppose leaving wasn't mentioned at that. Just a minute. He stuck his head back inside. Aaron, Dar, get out of here and help me open the gate. There's people want to leave. Don't argue, just do it. Two more of the watch appeared from inside, stopping to stare in sleepy surprise at the party of eight waiting to leave. Under the first watchman's urgings, they shuffled over to heave at the big wheel that raised the thick bar across the gates, then turned their efforts to cranking the gates open. The crank and ratchet made a rapid clicking sound, but the well-oiled gates swung outward silently. Before they were even a quarter open, though, a cold voice spoke out of the darkness. "'What is this?' Are these gates not ordered closed until sunrise? Five white-cloaked men walked into the light from the guardhouse door. Their cowls were drawn up to hide their faces, but each man rested his hand on his sword, and the golden suns on their left breasts were a plain announcement of who they were. Matt muttered under his breath. The watchmen stopped their cranking and exchanged uneasy looks. This is none of your affair, the first watchman said belligerently. Five white hoods turned to regard him, and he finished in a weaker tone. The children hold no sway here. The governor? 
The children of the light, the white-cloaked man, who at first spoken said softly, hold sway wherever men walk in the light. Only where the shadow of the dark one reigns are the children denied. Yes? He swung his hood from the watchman to Lan, then suddenly gave the warder a second, more wary look. The warder had not moved. In fact, he seemed completely at ease. But not many people could look at the children so uncaringly. Lan's stony face could as well have been looking at a boot black. When the white cloak spoke again, he sounded suspicious. What kind of people want to leave town walls in the night during times like these? With wolves stalking the darkness and the dark one's handiwork seen flying over the town. He eyed the braided leather band that crossed Lan's forehead and held his long hair back. A northerner, yes? Rand hunched lower in his saddle. A drakkar. It had to be that, unless the man just named anything he did not understand as the Dark One's handiwork. With a fade at the stag and lion, he should have expected a drakkar, but at the moment, he was hardly thinking about it. He thought he recognized the White Cloak's voice. Travelers, Lan replied calmly, of no interest to you or yours. Everyone is of interest to the Children of the Light. Lan shook his head slightly. Are you really after more trouble with the governor? He has limited your numbers in town, even had you followed. What will he do when he discovers you harassing honest citizens at his gates? He turned to the watchman. Why have you stopped? They hesitated, put their hands back on the crank, then hesitated again when the white cloak spoke. The governor does not know what happens under his nose. There is evil he does not see or smell, but the children of the light see. The watchmen looked at one another, their hands opened and closed as if regretting the spears left inside the guardhouse. The children of the light smell the evil. The white cloak's eyes turned to the people on horseback. We smell it and root it out, wherever it is found. Rand tried to make himself even smaller, but the movement drew the man's attention. What have we here? Someone who does not wish to be seen? What do you... Ah! The man brushed back the hood of his white cloak, and Rand was looking at the face he had known would be there. Bornhold nodded with obvious satisfaction. Clearly, Watchman, I have saved you from a great disaster. These are dark friends you were about to help escape from the light. You should be reported to your governor for discipline, or perhaps given to the questioners to discover your true intent this night. He paused, eyeing the watchman's fear. It seemed to have no effect on him. You would not wish that, no. Instead, I will take these ruffians to our camp that they may be questioned in the light. Instead of you, yes? You will take me to your camp, White Cloak. Moraine's voice came suddenly from every direction at once. She had moved back into the night at the children's approach, and shadows clumped around her. You will question me? Darkness wreathed her as she took a step forward. It made her seem taller. You will bar my way? Another step, and Rand gasped. She was taller, her head level with his where he sat on the gray's back. Shadows clung about her face like thunderclouds. I Sedai! Bornhold shouted, and five swords flashed from their sheaths. Die! The other four hesitated, but he slashed at her in the same motion that cleared his sword. Rand cried out as Moraine's staff rose to intercept the blade. That delicately carved wood could not possibly stop hard swung steel. Sword met staff, and sparks sprayed in a fountain, a hissing roar hurling Bornhold back into his white-cloaked companions. All five went down in a heap. Tendrils of smoke rose from Bornhold's sword on the ground beside him, blade bent at a right angle, where it had melted almost in two. You dare attack me? Moraine's voice roared like a whirlwind. Shadow spun in on her, draped her like a hooded cloak. She loomed as high as the town wall. Her eyes glared down, a giant staring at insects. Go! Lan shouted. In one lightning move, he snatched the reins of Moraine's mare and leaped into his own saddle. Now! he commanded. 
His shoulders brushed either gate as his stallion tore through the narrow opening like a flung stone. For a moment, Rand remained frozen, staring. Moraine's head and shoulders stood above the wall now. Watchmen and children alike cowered away from her, huddling with their backs against the front of the guardhouse. The Aes Sedai's face was lost in the night, but her eyes, as big as full moons, shone with impatience as well as anger when they touched him. Swallowing hard, he booted Cloud in the ribs and galloped after the others. Fifty paces from the wall, Land drew them up, and Rand looked back. Moraine's shadowed shape towered high over the log palisade, head and shoulders a deeper darkness against the night sky, surrounded by a silver nimbus from the hidden moon. As he watched, mouth hanging open, the Aes Sedai stepped over the wall. The gates began swinging shut frantically. As soon as her feet were on the ground outside, she was suddenly her normal size again. Hold the gates, an unsteady voice shouted inside the wall. Rand thought it was Bornhold. We must pursue them and take them. But the watchman did not slow the pace of closing. The gates slammed shut, and moments later, the bar crashed into place, sealing them. Maybe some of those other white cloaks aren't as eager to confront an Aes Sedai as Bornhold. Moraine hurried to Aldib, stroking the white mare's nose once before she tucked her staff under the girth strap. Rand did not need to look this time to know there was not even a nick in the staff. You are taller than a giant, Egwene said breathlessly, shifting on Bella's back. No one else spoke, though Matt and Perrin edged their horses away from the Aes Sedai. Was I? Moraine said absently as she swung into her saddle. I saw you, Egwene protested. The mind plays tricks in the night. The eye sees what is not there. This is no time for games, Nynaeve began angrily, but Moraine cut her off. No time for games indeed. What we gained at the Stag and Lion, we may have lost here. She looked back at the gate and shook her head. If only I could believe the Drakkar was on the ground. With a self-deprecatory sniff, she added, Or if only the Murdral were truly blind. If I am wishing, I might as well wish for the truly impossible. No matter. They know the way we must go, but with luck we will stay a step ahead of them. Lan? The water moved off eastward down the Camelin Road, and the rest followed close behind, hooves thudding rhythmically in the hard-packed earth. They kept to an easy pace, a fast walk the horses could maintain for hours without any Aes Sedai help. Before they had been even an hour on their way, though, Matt cried out, pointing back the way they had come. Look there! They all drew rein and stared. Flames lit the night over Berlon, as if someone had built a house-sized bonfire, tinting the undersides of the cloud with red. Sparks whipped into the sky in the wind. I warned him, Moraine said but he would not take it seriously. Aldib danced sideways, an echo of the Aes Sedai's frustration. He would not take it seriously. The inn, Perrin said. That's the stag and lion? How can you be sure? How far do you want to stretch coincidence? Tom asked. It could be the governor's house, but it isn't. And it isn't a warehouse, or somebody's kitchen stove, or your grandmother's haystack... Perhaps the light shines in us a little this night, Lance said, and Egwene rounded on him angrily. How can you say that? Poor Master Fitch's inn is burning. People may be hurt. If they have attacked the inn, Moraine said, perhaps our exit from the town and my display went unnoticed. Unless that's what the Murdral wants us to think, Lan added. Moraine nodded in the darkness. Perhaps... In any case, we must press on. There will be little rest for anyone tonight. You say that so easily, Moraine, Nynaeve exclaimed. What about the people at the inn? People must be hurt, and the innkeeper has lost his livelihood because of you. For all your talk about walking in the light, you're ready to go on without sparing a thought for him. His trouble is because of you. Because of those three, Lan said angrily. The fire, the injured, the going on, all because of those three. The fact that the price must be paid is proof that it is worth paying. The Dark One wants those boys of yours, and anything he wants this badly he must be kept from. 
Or would you rather let the Fade have them? Be at ease, Lan, Moraine said. Be at ease. Wisdom. You think I can help Master Fitch and the people at the inn? Well, you are right. Nynaeve started to say something, but Moraine waved it away and went on. I can go back by myself and give some help. Not too much, of course. That would draw attention to those I helped. Attention they would not thank me for, especially with the Children of the Light in the town. And that would leave only land to protect the rest of you. He is very good. But it will take more than him if a Murdral and a Fist of Trollocs find you. Of course, we could all return, though I doubt I can get all of us back into Berlon unnoticed. And that would expose all of you to whomever set that fire, not to mention the White Cloaks. Which alternative would you choose, Wisdom, if you were I? I would do something, Nynaeve muttered unwillingly. And in all probability, and the Dark One his victory, Moraine replied. Remember what, who it is that he wants. We are in a war, as surely as anyone in Giladan, though thousands fight there and only eight of us here. I will have gold sent to Master Fitch, enough to rebuild the stag and lion. Gold that cannot be traced to Tarvalon, and help for any who were hurt as well. Any more than that will only endanger them. It is far from simple, you see. Lan? The warder turned his horse and took up the road again. From time to time, Rand looked back. Eventually, all he could see was the glow on the clouds, and then even that was lost in the darkness. He hoped Min was all right. All was still pitch dark when the warder finally led them off the packed dirt of the road and dismounted. Rand estimated there were no more than a couple of hours till dawn. They hobbled the horses, still saddled, and made a cold camp. One hour, Lan warned as everyone except him was wrapping up in their blankets. He would stand guard while they slept. One hour, and we must be on our way. Silence settled over them. After a few minutes, Matt spoke in a whisper that barely reached Rand. I wonder what Dav did with that badger. Rand shook his head silently, and Matt hesitated. Finally, he said, I thought we were safe, you know, Rand. Not a sign of anything since we crossed the Tarn. And there we were in a city with walls around us. I thought we were safe. And then that dream and a fade... Are we ever going to be safe again? Not until we get to Tar Valen, Rand said. That's what she told us. Will we be safe then? Perrin asked softly, and all three of them looked to the shadowy mound that was the Aes Sedai. Land had melted into the darkness. He could have been anywhere. Rand yawned suddenly. The others twitched nervously at the sound. I think we'd better get some sleep, he said. Staying awake won't answer anything. Perrin spoke quickly. She should have done something. No one answered. Rand squirmed onto his side to avoid a root, tried his back, then rolled off a stone onto his belly and another root. It was not a good campsite they had stopped at, not like the spots the warder had chosen on the way north from the Taran. He fell asleep, wondering if the roots digging into his ribs would make him dream and woke at Lan's touch on his shoulder, ribs aching and grateful that if any dreams had come, he did not remember them. It was still the dark just before dawn, but once the blankets were rolled and strapped behind their saddles, Lan had them riding east again. As the sun rose, they made a bleary-eyed breakfast on bread and cheese and water, eating while they rode, huddled in their cloaks against the wind. All except Lan, that is. He ate, but he was not bleary-eyed and he did not huddle. He had changed back into his shifting cloak and it whipped around him, fluttering through greys and greens, and the only mind he painted was to keep it clear of his sword arm. His face remained without expression, but his eyes searched constantly, as if he expected an ambush any moment. <laughs>